You know, let's go back four years ago. Ben Carson was polling number one. In the latest chapter of the House Democrats' quest to get a look at President Trump's tax returns, the Ways and Means Committee is suing the Treasury Department and the IRS. Democrats are hoping that a favorable court ruling will force the hand of Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, who refused a request for the returns in May, as well as two subpoenas. Opening day for the newly fragmented European Parliament kicked off, unsurprisingly on a sour note. As a quartet performed Europe's anthem, Ode to Joy, the 29 members of the Brexit party turned their backs, signaling they're not happy they're there though they're apparently fine with collecting their nearly $9,000 monthly paychecks. Nike's decision to heed its critics and pull its 4th of July sneakers featuring the old Betsy Ross American flag has upset Arizona's governor. Doug Ducey tapped out a series of rage tweets slamming the decision and announcing he'd withdraw state financial incentives offered for a planned Nike factory. It's unclear whether that'll do much to dissuade the $32 billion company. Arizona's Commerce Authority had offered a grant of up to a million dollars. Every time I go to a TV show, hey, hey, can you teach me how to say a cr? Hey, 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 every time I go do a commercial, hey, can you finish it off with a cr? You think I ain't gonna profit off this shit? Turns out Cardi B won't be profiting off that shit. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office rejected her application to trademark her catchphrase, saying it falls under the category of widely used commonplace expressions. Yo. The Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General's Office released a report today detailing the dire conditions in Customs and Border Protection facilities in the Rio Grande Valley, the southernmost part of Texas, and the axis of an unfolding humanitarian crisis. The overcrowding, poor conditions, and frustrations are getting so bad, one facility manager told inspectors the situation is, quote, a ticking time bomb. And terrible conditions at Border Patrol facilities are getting increasing attention after doctors and lawyers reported unsanitary housing conditions and malnourished children. Those reports prompted Democratic lawmakers to tour some of those facilities yesterday. We saw that the system is still broken and that people's human rights are still being abused. Today's report piled on. These are some of the pictures OIG inspectors took during their unannounced visit at five Border Patrol facilities and two ports of entry in June. They saw 8,000 migrants held in detention, nearly half of whom had been held longer than the 72 hours CBP standards allow. Inspectors also found more than 50 kids under the age of seven. Some adults had been stuck for a week in standing room only areas. Others had been held for longer than a month. One image reads 88 adult males held in a cell with a maximum capacity of 41. Inspectors said detainees banged on the walls and pressed themselves up against windows as they walked by. They noted that tensions are getting strained inside and cited the overcrowding and prolonged detention as an immediate risk to everyone inside, migrants and workers. They spoke with migrants who hadn't showered in a month and who'd been given nothing but bologna sandwiches to eat the entire time they'd been in custody. Today's report comes after the Inspector General's office already issued warnings back in May about overcrowding at Border Patrol stations, which are not designed to hold people for long periods of time. But it seems the problem has only gotten worse. Advocates who've spoken with migrants say they've been ringing the alarm about conditions for a while now. ACLU Texas attorney Rochelle Garza has interviewed hundreds of migrants after they've been released from CBP custody. People have been held for very long periods of time without access to showers, without access to adequate food, water, sanitary conditions. And this includes children, babies, pregnant women, adults, everyone. Just yesterday, I was talking to a woman that had been released from custody, and she was in a cell for five days with her three children, all of them under the age of four. And she was telling me that she was in the cell that was completely overcrowded with a pregnant woman who had been there for 12 days. And that woman could only cry. There, there was nothing 
there was no hope in her. Conditions are just worsening, and it seems like people are treating it as if it's the new normal. DHS responded to the report, saying that it's added two new tent cities for 500 people, that it's planning to open another facility. But it's unclear if they can build them fast enough. The system is completely overwhelmed, and there are bottlenecks everywhere along the way. Border Patrol, ICE, and HHS are all maxed out on the number of people they can hold. It's also unclear what anyone is doing to actually address these problems aside from asking for more money or visiting these facilities. Congress has yet to introduce any legislation to address the conditions inside, but the House Committee on Oversight and Reform has now called for a hearing with the acting heads of DHS and CBP next week to try to get some answers. So we're either going to get on this flight or we're going to try and find a charter to get What time would we get in if we get on this flight? Either way, we will probably get in by like 1 or 2 a.m. 2 a.m.? Yeah. Montana Governor Steve Bullock is running for president. But he's having a little trouble getting his campaign off the ground. Literally. Last Wednesday, while other candidates took the stage in Miami, Bullock was stuck in an airport. He, he said like... Uh, do you feel like a pathetic loser right now, knowing that everyone else is in Miami and you're sitting here with me? And I said, really? Pathetic loser? <laughs> I did not say pathetic loser. I, mean, I already have self-esteem issues here. <laughs> did I really need that? <laughs> Keep in mind, this guy's actually a pretty big deal in Democratic politics. His resume. He won statewide in the same state President Trump won by 20 points. He can get Republicans to do things that Democrats like. In fact, that's what he's been doing all year instead of running for president. Montana is one of the few states with a Republican-controlled legislature to embrace Obamacare and expand Medicaid. In May, Bullock signed the bill that kept that expansion going. He thinks governing and not getting in the race earlier was the smart move. But he didn't make the first round of debates, and he's on the bubble for the second round. He has to make being late to the party seem smart. He's trying the self-deprecating approach. Please welcome the sitting governor of Montana and candidate for the Democratic nomination, Steve Bullock. Thank you, Steve. And let me begin by saying Just that I... Just governor. This is a debate, so let's meet your challengers. Next up, governor of Montana, Steve Bullock. I look forward to a spirited debate. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Is it weird for you? Like, just to, I mean, you're the governor of a large and wealthy state. And, you know... It's like people are saying, hey, that woman who wrote those books for <laughs> Oprah is was a little politically smarter than him because she got in earlier than you. I mean, is this a strange feeling to be like this also ran in this early stage of this field? Is it strange when you look at that overall field and I wasn't one of them on the debate stage? Yeah, from my perspective, but not only my perspective. Other folks have turned around and waited and said, well, wait a minute. Here's a governor, the only one in this field that won in a Trump state. Here's somebody that has actually been able to get things done. And if we're not talking to voters, urban and rural, if we're not talking to folks, both that we need to bring out and traditionally and those that we've lost, we're probably not gonna win this election. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. With almost all the other candidates in Miami, Bullock tried to take advantage of the open space in New Hampshire and Iowa. Instead of trying to get three minutes, actually get a talk for 40 minutes with the first voters who will actually decide this. In Iowa, the campaign bought a bunch of appetizers and held a town hall watch party to raise his profile. So what did you know about Steve Bullock before today? I didn't know anything about it. Which needs a lot of raising. Well, help me understand the word electability. Like, everybody talks about it. What does it mean to you? It, it means somebody who can um, go up against the president head to head. So what boxes does Steve Bullock check on the electability checklist? I don't know yet. I haven't seen much. He, of course, supports all the, the issues that I, I support. Again, I like that he has done administration. I'm going to watch and see. Bullock's centrist red state Democrat pitch might be a good general election strategy. But in a primary where the left is getting all the attention, he's got to sell the center hard. And let's talk about this idea of Montana and your ability to work with uh, the other side of the aisle. What's wrong with how Democrats talk to Republicans? It's not just 
talking to the legislators in the state house, it's when their constituents start saying to them that this is bigger than politics, this is about our community, that I think that's how I've been able to make change. How do you make that happen? Like, what do you, what, what secret magic power do you have <laughs> but, but, but that, that other Democrats don't have? It's not just like sitting down and saying, hey McConnell, let's have a beer. Maybe McConnell doesn't want to, or anyone else in DC, they want to say, oh, well, oh, we're not gonna work with Bullock or we're not gonna work with whoever. But if you actually make your case to Americans by going to Kentucky and say, there's only one thing holding up healthcare right now for your rural communities and it's your senator. That makes it more than just about the partisan food fight of the day. Oh, hey, I'm Steve. Yeah. Lee, nice yeah. to meet you as well. Oh, I'm so happy. Hi, my name is Rio. I'm with Governor Steve Bullock's campaign for president. How are you doing this afternoon? You know, a long way to go with 225 days before people vote, but I'm gonna earn it here. You know, let's go back four years ago. Ben Carson was polling number one. Or let's go to 1991. Bill Clinton didn't even get into the race until October. So I think that there's a whole lot of time. Elections still ought to be about people talking to people more than just the debate stages. But it's not 1991. Everything's earlier now, including two more debates scheduled for September. Protesters in Hong Kong prepared before dawn Monday to square off with police. July 1st is normally a day of activism there, the date Britain handed its territory over to China. This year's anniversary was bound to be more intense. For months, Hong Kongers have been building a movement to pressure the legislature to drop a bill that would let suspected criminals be extradited to the mainland. Hours later, demonstrators used a different tactic, holding a peaceful march that drew half a million people. But an offshoot group was frustrated that nonviolent protests have only gotten the government to suspend the bill. They gathered a few blocks away at the Legislative Council building and started smashing windows. By dusk, protesters had made their way in, tagging their grievances on the walls. In the council chamber, they tore up copies of the basic law, the set of rules that Britain and China had agreed to. Then they draped Britain's colonial flag on the seat of power and blacked out the island's emblem. Protesters got word police were planning to sweep the building at midnight. Those caught were at risk of getting a 10-year sentence for rioting. They fought over what to do, and some protesters forced the others out. At 4 a.m. local time, the island's chief executive appointed by China held a press conference. This is something that uh, we should seriously condemn because nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. Britain's foreign minister tweeted that the UK's support for Hong Kong was, quote, unwavering. But China had a reminder for Britain. We 
表示坚决反对和强烈的不满。China hasn't intervened yet, but this statement is a warning that they may not stand for whatever protests come next. 2015 ما بر اساس اون چی که اعلام کردیم خیلی شفاف گفتیم چه کار میکنیم و بر اساس اون عمل میکنیم و این رو از حقوق خودمون در داخل برجام میدیم This is a direct challenge to the European countries that spent the weekend scrambling to save it Now sanctions can be legally reimposed which has been President Trump's main strategy since he pulled out. The Iran deal is defective at its core. If we do nothing, we know exactly what will happen. Sanctions might stop Iran from acquiring the world's most dangerous weapons, but they won't stop Iran from doing what it's done since the 1980s, sponsor a network of militias. I think the idea behind maximum pressure policy is that this would deprive Iran of the resources that it has to advance its regional policy, including to support for its uh, partners and proxies around the region. But the Iranian regional policy has been designed precisely for it to be low cost and asymmetric. It's not uncommon to pay proxy forces as part of your defense strategy. The U.S. is doing it right now by funding Kurds in Syria. But this is Iran's main tactic. It has as many as 180,000 foreign fighters that have taken on the U.S. and its regional allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia. In Iraq, its paramilitary are entrenched in Iraqi security forces, and its militia are accused of placing rockets near American bases. In Lebanon, Iran's Revolutionary Guards train Hezbollah fighters at a cost of $700 million a year. In the Palestinian territories, It's given Hamas $50 million to put pressure on Israel. And in Yemen, it's the main sponsor of Houthi rebels, as they wage war with Saudi Arabia. So far, proxies have been relatively cheap and effective, but there are signs Iran may be diversifying. It is the assessment of the United States government that the Islamic Republic of Iran is responsible for the attacks that occurred in the Gulf of Oman today. Iran denies it was behind it, But if they were, they managed to disrupt the global markets by threatening the petroleum supply chain, which drove up oil prices. And at the end of the day, their last dollar will go to what they see as critical to their national security. I think it's very unlikely that Iran, uh, even if it's forced into severe austerity, uh, that it would cut off support for partners and proxies. Pride March is always big, but this year's was even bigger. That's because this June marked the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, and New York was host to World Pride, a global event. Today, we are expecting approximately 1,800 to 2,000 volunteers. Last year, we saw about 50 to 60,000 participants. This year, we're looking at 150,000 participants. Last year we had about 90 floats, this year we're looking at 160. Everybody celebrates their pride in different ways. I was the first Senator March in this parade, and I won't be the last. One day, there'll be a hundred. So you do want to have fun moments, but you do want to impress the seriousness of the things that still need to change. The Pride March has come a long way in the years following the riots at New York's Stonewall Inn where bar patrons led by trans women of color rebelled against police harassment. Even 
25 years ago, at the last big Stonewall anniversary, the organization behind the march, Heritage of Pride, struggled to fund events and attract corporate and celebrity support. So the fact that this year's march was the biggest in American history shows how far the movement has come. But not everyone in the LGBTQ community is thrilled. This year, a group who says the main march fails to represent the true spirit of Pride staged their own. They call themselves the Reclaim Pride Coalition. Reclaim Pride is taking back our history. It's taking queerness back from capitalism and corporations. Gays against guns. NRA sashay away. I chose to help plan this march um, instead of the regular Pride Parade because this aligns with what I think Pride should be. It's a march and a protest. It's not about the floats or the parade or the sponsors. It's about us. It's about queer people. What's the issue with having uh, corporations march in a Pride march? Why is that a problem? The issue with corporations is that they only care about us in the month of June. Some of the same corporations that have, you know, a Pride logo are also donating to organizations that oppress queer people. Reclaim Pride isn't the first group to splinter off from Heritage of Pride events and call out the corporate advertisers and police presence in the march. New York City's Dyke March has been doing that for 27 years. Like Reclaim Pride, they operate without a permit, something Dyke March organizers say is key to holding a true protest. We are a uh, not like corporate sponsored uh, pride event. We are um, looking to not have as much of a police presence. And I asked how I could help. And they said that they needed marshals kind of to control our own crowd instead of just kind of being like pushed around by like dudes with guns. Do you think that the Dyke March is about politics or is it about identity? Is it about both? I think politics and identity and all that shit is all the same. I think the only reason that we can afford to not talk about politics is when it doesn't affect us, which means that that's like a privilege. So how do you feel about the Heritage of Pride march that happens on Sunday? Last year, I went with some friends and like, I was kind of, I was excited about like, you know, the community coming together. And then I went and it was fun because I was with my friends and that was fine. But we were just getting like, like pride flags with TD Bank, like, and pens like thrown at us. This is so not new. These are the same conversations we were having when they did the first march in 1970. Kathy Renna is a spokesperson for Heritage of Pride and an LGBTQ activist who's participated in the Dyke March and the Heritage of Pride March for years. They wanted to, to be very political, but then at the end they wanted to dance. And, you know, that was a time when organizations, especially when the AIDS epidemic hit, where <laughs> no resources. They would beg for anybody. Companies that would, would support us in any way um, were incredibly welcome. So there's a purpose to having Google. employees of Google, Pepsi, or ExxonMobil yeah. yeah. in, in the march. What people really need to look at is, again, the bigger picture. People get fixated on, oh, well, there's a big float. It has the Google you know, logo on the side. That's not what this is about. This is about Google doing stuff all year round. And it's also about something that I think is really, really important that people don't think about, which is the power that, that corporate America in showing leadership around equality. Even people who have been in the movement for a long time don't really realize how far we've come in such a short period of time. 50 years is nothing. It's a blink of an eye. Many attendees at New York Pride March told us they felt uncomfortable with brands taking up so much space. But a good party can be hard to ignore. Are you going to be marching in the Heritage of Pride Pride March that's happening later today? Um, I will be. I'll be marching with another contingent in Heritage of Pride. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. And while they don't align with everything that I believe in, I know that there are still a lot of queer people who aren't ready to protest against capitalism and all of these other things who are going to be there. And I'm going to bring that same attitude and support them.